I'm John Banther, and this is Classical Breakdown. From Classical WETA in Washington, we take you behind the music. In this episode, I'm joined by principal bassoon of the National Symphony Orchestra, Sue Heineman. She tells us all about the bassoon, like what sets it apart from the rest of the wind section and how its role evolved over the centuries. She even plays for us some of her favorite orchestral moments and tells us how she has to make part of her instrument by hand every week. Okay, Sue, if people listen to classical music, they've heard the bassoon many, many times before. But if you had to describe it in just a couple of sentences, what would you say? What would you say about the bassoon? Okay, so visually, I usually say bassoon is the one that you think is the oboe. Because I have discovered that a lot of people know the word oboe, maybe from crossword puzzles, and they know that there's a flute, they know the clarinet, and then there's something else. And I think people maybe don't quite differentiate between the oboe and the clarinet visually, so because they both are like black, you know, sort of around the same length things that just to, you know, mouth to lap. And then there's that big thing. So, and in fact, I, it never occurred to me until a few years ago that people have the same confusion about the oboe. There is actually this hilarious video on YouTube that a friend of mine made where she goes around New York asking people, do you know which one the oboe is? Is it big or small? And a lot of people say, oh, it's big. So they, oboists also find this confusion. So the bassoon is the big one that kind of is at an angle and it has a curvy metal bit that goes from your mouth to the bassoon. So that is the bassoon. And if I want to tell people where they've probably heard the bassoon, I'll probably start with Mickey Mouse, Fantasia. If they've ever seen The Sorcerer's Apprentice, those are bassoons. The main tune, Peter and the Wolf, we play the grandfather, the low rumbly thing. If they recognized, yes, I've seen Fantasia, then I might also say, we're also the instrument that's at the beginning of the one with the dinosaurs. That's the opening to the Rite of Spring, which is at the opposite end of the range of the grandfather. So that's funny how people confuse, oh, it's a it's an oboe. Then they look at the oboe, oh, that's, that's like a bassoon or something. But what about the sound? How does the sound compare, for instance, to the oboe or to the clarinet? What sets it apart? Okay, so the oboe and the bassoon are both double reed instruments. And a double reed is two things vibrating against each other. The clarinet and the saxophone are single reed instruments. The oboe actually has a more sort of focused, concentrated tone. It really penetrates the orchestra, which is why the oboe gives the A at the beginning of the performances, just because when people start tuning, you can still hear that sound. And it's also why the oboe tends to get a lot more solo material than a bassoon, because it's just more audible. Actually, when I was a kid and learning the instruments, I more often got the sound of the bassoon and the clarinet mixed up, because they're both sort of warmer, darker kinds of sounds than an oboe or a flute. I mean, it's easy to tell what a flute is. Everybody knows what a flute sounds like. And because we have such a huge range, you know, there's not really one sound. Like if you hear the bassoon in the high register versus the low register, it they're really different sounds. Yeah, the sound, they're different in terms of the wherever you are in the range, but it has that warm, to me, I think just kind of like a, a woody sound, maybe because mm-hmm. the instrument's made out of wood or something. But there's a lot of texture to the sound, where as the clarinet and oboe is more like a smooth, glassy surface, I would I would kind of describe it. And you touched on a double reed. That's a big differentiating factor for this kind of instrument, right? You have two pieces of wood basically vibrating together because if we look at how other instruments make sounds it's kind of easy you know a violin you there's a bow that goes across and vibrates a string on the flute you you blow across that hole brass players you buzz into the mouthpiece where is the sound actually coming from or being made with this double reed because i guess that's kind of like in the inside like in the middle of your mouth isn't it yeah so Like anybody who's blown across a Coke bottle, that's kind of what it's like to make a sound on a flute. If you take a blade of grass and you hold it between your thumbs and you blow into that, that's a single reed. So that's like clarinet. Whereas the oboe and the bassoon, it's a double reed. And we make them ourselves. Most professional oboes and bassoonists make their own reeds. 
you actually start with a single piece of cane, it looks like bamboo, and you end up folding it over onto itself and shaping and forming it and stuff like that and forming a tube. And then you cut the tip off. So now you're blowing between two pieces of wood that used to be one piece of wood, if that makes sense. The thing goes into your mouth and that's how we make the sound. This is what a reed sounds like on its own. It almost sounds like that, that kind of duck, duck call sound, right? Yeah, it really does sound like a duck call. People say that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so you mentioned something that I think will blow a lot of people's minds, and that is you actually make your reeds. And I know this, I mean, this is something that's tremendously difficult, but it's also super time consuming. I mean, tell us a little bit about, you know, how much time it takes, what goes into having to make part of your instrument just all the time. Yeah. Like I said, we start with tube cane. It looks like bamboo. It's it's a, just a different kind of grass called Arundo Donax. All of us have like a reed desk in our homes, like where all of our tools are spread out. We have machines that scoop out the, the stuff. For, like you split these tubes of cane and then you have one machine that cuts out the pith, um, all the stuff in the middle. So what you want to get is just the bark of this piece of grass and then the small amount of the I'm not a botanist, so (laughs) the the stuff that, you know, is closest to that. Yeah. And then you have another machine, you flip it over, and you have another machine that then removes the bark. And so then you're left with just this very thin part of cane. And then you have another machine or, you know, lots of hand tools that you shape it and scrape it and you put wires on it and sandpaper and files and just all kinds of stuff. And all of this stuff is done to like very accurate measurements. The, these machines are set up to hundredths of a millimeter, I think, or thousandths of an inch. And we have a little dial indicator. So you can like, as you're scraping it, kind of measure the different parts along the, the blade to make sure it's even. I mean, a lot of it's just it's so very personal, which is why we all have to make our own reads because, you know, sometimes I compare it to like shoes because they have to go into your mouth on your instrument, the way your mouth is structured, your lips, your whatever, the instrument, and then also like your values as a, as a musician and artist, like which things feel the most important as we're making reads. There's all, all kinds of compromises like, well, I can play loudly on this one and have this big giant sound, but you know, you got to play softly in the orchestra too, or this sounds fantastic, but it's just too sharp or, you know, for flexibility, you know, and sometimes you just like one scrape too far and you were trying to get it a little more flexible and now the whole thing is collapsed and it doesn't work. And because it's in your mouth and it's, you know, your saliva is on it and you're, and it's very thin pieces of wood that are vibrating it, you know, there's only so long before the wood just weakens and, you know, it's almost like it starts to disintegrate a little bit. So, yeah, we're constantly making new reeds. They're also affected by the weather. Air temperature, humidity, it has a different feel depending on where you sit on the stage. And we'll choose different reeds maybe depending on what piece we're playing. Like this piece has a lot of exposed high notes or that piece has a lot of exposed low notes or this piece I have a big solo where I want to have a lot of colors where, or this other piece, I need to just really be more transparent and I'm mostly having a blending function. Yeah. It's just all kinds of different nuances that go into it. I know for myself that there's so many things that it's, there's so much intricate work. I could probably never, um, the bassoon is not for me. It's, it sounds like it's, it's a lot. (laughs) So can you take us a little bit through the bassoon through time. I'm not wondering maybe just how it was invented, but how was it used in its early period? Because I'm sure the way the bassoon is used today in the orchestra was very different hundreds of years ago, um, like in the 1600s or something like that. Yeah. So the bassoon in like the Baroque period, you usually will find the bassoon playing what's called continuo. which basically means we're playing the same line as the cellos and the basses. And so the bassoon at that period was largely used as a, to add color to the the low string sound. We weren't that much of a solo instrument. There is one movement in the Bachby minor mass where the bassoon, there's a 
two bassoons and a French horn. And we're doing actually fairly intricate trill work, and it's, but that's the rest of the piece. It's, we're just doing bass lines, and, which is fun. I mean, it's really interesting because Baroque music, the bass lines are moving all over the place, and it's very interesting, like we're the little engine. When you get a little bit later, like into Mozart's time, you start to hear many more sort of individual lines. His operas are full of bassoon solos. And they were still playing on pretty basic instruments back then with only a, a few keys on them. The modern bassoon has like 24, 25, 26 keys, depending on your particular instrument. And you only have 10 fingers. Exactly. Well, our left thumb has to do nine or 10. One of my bassoons had 10 keys for my left thumb. The one I currently play on only has nine. Okay. But, um, yeah, that, no left thumb does, that, left, <laughs> that left thumb does that left the that left thumb does a lot of work. So actually, there were a lot of Baroque composers did write bassoon concertos, including Vivaldi, who wrote like 38 or 39 of them. So many that, and, and well, he taught it at an orphanage for young girls, and there was an orchestra there, and there must have been a really good bassoonist. There's a lot of Vivaldi concerti. There are other, other Baroque composers wrote bassoon solo pieces too. It might be worth mentioning, like if you go and see a performance of like the Messiah, for example, you know, the bassoon will be playing along with the bass lines, but sometimes, depending on the conductor's choices, sometimes there will be movements where it's just the bassoon playing the bass line. Like you might have like the two oboes and the bassoon and the singer. So at that point, we're kind of a solo role, but we're still doing the bass line. But like the melodic materials and the, yeah, the little lyrical solos and stuff really start to jump out Haydn symphonies. And Mozart wrote a bassoon concerto when he was 18 years old, which is by far the most often played bassoon concerto, and it's on every audition for a symphony orchestra. Lovely little piece. And I will say, we're going to put videos on the show notes page of a lot of the music you're mentioning, especially the Vivaldi concertos. For me, that's how, I mean, I fell in love with the bassoon and its sound, how it can be so intense and then rough and but then all of a sudden you know a moment later very soft and lyrical there um as you said there was there had to be a couple of incredible bassoonists at the orphanage for vivaldi to be writing some of that music it's um it's incredible and going into the 1800s um, up until now it's kind of like it has a couple of different roles right you're having these beautiful solo moments and then moments where you're just in the texture moments where you're more of following with the bass line it sounds like after the 1800s, it kind of goes in every direction. Yeah, I think that's that's a pretty good summary of it. Sometimes we're playing just right along with the string basses, and then other times it's a big solo. And But most of the time, we're doing an inner voice. And it still might be very exposed and something that, you know, for which we have to make a special read. For example, to play like a Brahms symphony or a Beethoven symphony, there's a lot of like little bassoon solos here and there, but there's also a lot of times when like the woodwinds are playing together. So maybe it's a clarinet melody or the oboe has the melody and the bassoon is weaving in and out in the middle. And, you know, that's where we need to be really flexible. Again, it's always about the reeds, like being able to come in and out and be flexible because at that point you're, you're contributing color and, you know, shape and texture. And, you know, you might sometimes have like the really cool harmonies. It's, it's actually really fun to play those parts, but you have to do it on somebody else's time. Like you don't get to determine the shape of the phrase for the most part. The melody instrument is for the most part determining that. So that's why like where we sit, you know, we're all sitting in a cluster there and I'm just always, my ears are just, it's like radar, you know, trying to like figure out like where is the flute going to move here? Where's the oboe going to move? And I, you, if you look at the, my parts, it'll often say like clarinet or horn or whatever, just to kind of remind me, like, to whom do I need to pay attention here? It's really not just follow the conductor. It's like chamber music. Playing a woodwind in an orchestra is really like chamber music, and you have to be flexible and responsive all the time to like different people. And sometimes it's hard because sometimes they're far away from you. Like maybe I, suddenly I'm here with a flute and then suddenly now I'm with a horn. And I have to try to change my color to match a horn color, which is different. Or I'll have to use like less vibrato because I'm playing with the clarinet because the clarinet generally doesn't play with vibrato, that kind of thing. It sounds like the bassoon is the chameleon of Mm -hmm. the orchestra. You have to blend with 
fellow woodwind players and then you know, some of the brass and then, oh, now I'm over here with the, the cellos, that kind of thing. Yeah. But how does one start with the bassoon? Did you choose to play the bassoon right from the beginning or maybe someone else chose for you or did you start on a different instrument? So I'm the youngest of three. We're all fairly close in age. We're all within about three and a half years. And so when we were little kids, we all started taking piano lessons. And then when each of us in sequence moved schools between fourth and fifth grade, we all switched schools. And so the middle school we went to had an orchestra program, at which point, actually, honestly, I don't know when my sister started playing the violin, but she was playing violin in the orchestra and my brother was playing tuba. And so it's like, okay, now I'm going to Masterman, that's the name of the school, and it's time to pick an orchestra instrument. And I was like, all right, I don't know, cello? That looks good, whatever. And they're like, oh, well, we don't have any cellos. How about this nice viola? I was like, sure, whatever, I didn't care. So I played the viola for a while, and I just, I don't know, I just, it's so random. You know, you're 10 years old, and I didn't really like the viola teacher. I didn't want to learn that clef. Like I could read bass clef and I could read treble clef, but like that alto clef thing, I was just like, I was just playing by ear the entire time. And for whatever reason, it just Hi, stick. it's John, post-episode. I just wanted to jump in and explain this for a moment. In music, we have two main clefs, treble and bass. You can think of them like the key to a map. They give you a reference to where the notes are on a musical staff. And it's what you'll typically see on piano music. But there are other clefs too, sometimes used for specific instruments or parts in the music like alto and tenor clef. But they have the same function as the more common treble and bass clefs. Okay, back to Sue. And for whatever reason, it just didn't stick. I don't know. It just didn't stick. So I was like, all right, I'm done with string instruments. How about a nice woodwind? And I knew I didn't want to take something like flute that just seemed like too obvious. I wanted something a little bit more that seemed more interesting. I was like, that thing looks interesting. What's that? I'll take that. It was kind of like that. My sister, who by this point was the concert master of the orchestra in my little middle school, she had a good friend who played the bassoon who loved it and so that that was very appealing. She, you know, she she just she was she sold it well. And see, so and they needed a second bassoon for the orchestra. And the other thing that was very cool about picking the bassoon was that within a week I was in the orchestra because they only had one. So now we had two. Had I t- chosen the flute, I probably wouldn't have immediately been able to play in the orchestra. And I mean, honestly, once I played in the orchestra, and it was this little abridged high school version of the first movement of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. I was hooked. I was like, I like orchestra. So like orchestra became my instrument and it was no longer like, you know, I wasn't thinking like, well, the bassoon, nobody told me about the reeds, you know, guess what? We have to read tenor clef, which is basically like reading alto clef, one ledger line different. So that's how I ended up on the bassoon. And and that's a big thing too, thinking about there are a million flute players, a million people wanting to play trumpet. And if you're young and you're wanting to get into um, the local orchestra, whether in your school or a, a youth orchestra, there's instruments that are always in need, and it sounds like bassoons are, are one of those instruments. Now, tell us a little bit more about how the bassoon is fitting within the woodwind section, because it's not just you by your lonesome up there with the one bassoon. There's a couple of you, right? I mean, how is it typically two or three? How is the bassoon section fitting in? The way the bassoon section is configured is generally the way the other winds are configured. So some orchestras will have three-person sections. So you'll have like first flute, second flute, and a utility flute piccolo kind of. So the, the piccolo player sometimes will play second flute, sometimes play piccolo. In an orchestra like the NSO, you're gonna, you have four people. You have a principal and an assistant principal. Those people divide up the first chair stuff. And then you have the second and then the, the piccolo. So our analog to that is that we have a principal bassoonist, an assistant principal bassoonist. That person and I sit in the same chair, not at the same time. But we'll, if you come to an NSO concert, you'll see, like, you'll, usually you'll notice that the people, are, it's different people on the first half than the second half. Then we have a second bassoon, and then there's the contra bassoon. So that's like the our version of the piccolo. So since it's at the lower end, the contra bassoon is low. Much it's much lower. It's an octave lower than the bassoon. The second bassoonist is really important to the whole woodwind section, the whole orchestra, because that person is really laying down the bass line 
for the woodwind stuff. It, it's a, I mean, all of the second winds are also very delicate and exposed and solo instruments, you know, even though they're, they don't get like the big giant lyrical solos there. It's important for them also to have, this, I mean, they have the same reed issues, you know, sometimes worse because to play like low oboe and low bassoon is really hard. And, and they're really responsible for anchoring the section, laying a good foundation sound wise and intonation wise. And sometimes we'll have duets together and that kind of thing. Now, you mentioned the contrabassoon, and we, we won't get into that now. That is a whole nother thing, but it is it is a massive instrument. That's one that you can easily overlook if you're in the audience looking at the stage. I think because of the color and how it's not so much taller or something, it's it kind of blends in, I think, with the, the color of, of the stage. All right, Sue, so let's hear a little bit of what the bassoon can do here in the orchestra. I understand you have some examples, some solos or moments from pieces you want to play. Yeah, so the first one will be the opening to the Rite of Spring, which, uh, like I mentioned, is in the movie Fantasia. I mean, the whole piece is incredible, but just to to be the person to to start off that piece is, it's always like this surreal experience, because on the one hand, this excerpt is on every orchestral audition that you ever take for Principal Bassoon, but playing it on stage, the conductor comes out, it's always on the second half, and there's applause, and then it's like silent, and conductor stands there and you're like I get to start this piece yeah oh my god I have to start this piece (laughs) it's like what if I didn't play um and it's it's just it's just an amazing you know in the very highest register of the of the instrument we start out all alone and then bit by bit other lower instruments come in you have a horn you got some bass clarinets going on and it's just a really really cool excerpt okay let's hear it When you're playing that, it does sound like it, that's a very high register on the bassoon, and you're starting this piece off. It, it's kind of like it's the first notes, but it's like the first notes of the dawn of time. And then just from that little part that you played, it goes on with the other instruments joining in, like you mentioned. When I hear it, I think of if I was playing the bassoon, I would be trying to portray some kind of slithering, slimy creature just kind of going on the surface of the earth, you know, billions of years ago. Oh, how funny. I've never thought about it as a slithering, slimy creature, but I definitely think about the sort of dawn of time kind of a thing. And you come in and it's not clear, like, who's playing. To a lot of people, I think, you know, because, you know, as we've discussed, a lot of people don't know which one the bassoon is, and it's in the highest register, and and it's just the sound comes out of nowhere. And the rhythms, I mean, they're written very precisely, but there's also, like, starts and stops, and so it sounds amorphous in a way. And then I have to say, I mean, of all the big solos to play that are scary, this is kind of one of the most fun because once you've finished, you get to sit on stage and listen to the orchestra play The Rite of Spring, which is just an awesome piece. It's just amazing to be sitting in the middle of that and knowing, oh, I'm all done. (laughs) And I get to listen to this incredible stuff. And that's the funny part you're mentioning there, because, yeah, you're done. And that's if I had a huge solo, I would want it to be on the very first moments. So yeah, then you can just you know, sit back and enjoy. And then, of course, someone else has a big solo, you know, 20 minutes later that they're having to gear up for. That's that's uh, I love it. I mean, the downside, of course, is if it doesn't go well, then you have to sit on the stage for the entire time before you can go Ooh, crawl in a hole. <laughs> that's that, Stravinsky gives and he takes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that's one of the most iconic moments for bassoon. What else do you have? Okay, so another really famous bassoon solo, and again, you know, it's what we call an audition excerpt. It's on every audition, is the solo from the second movement of Scheherazade. This is also, this is a pretty comfortable range for us to play, and it's fun because you can have some freedom and flexibility. The violin plays this really high, just beautiful, you know, she's Scheherazade. I say she because, you know, 
for the past 20 years, it's been Nareet and she's Shahrazad. Yeah. So she plays this high, just sweet, sweet little solo. And then, and then I come in, you know, and it's, it's a lot of dynamic and contrast and legato and staccato, you know, short notes, long notes, whatever. And you get to stretch and it's just it's really fun to play. It's, it's quite free because the only other thing that's going on is low strings. And you have to be kind of in contact with the conductor to let them know, like, okay, I'm going to come up to this place here where the basses change notes. But other than that, you can have some freedom to just kind of pull and push a little bit. Yeah, it's just that one's really fun to play. So now we've heard something that is a big moment for the bassoon, but totally different from the Stravinsky you played a moment ago. I mean, you, you have all this freedom here, and it sounds like it's so characteristic. Like it's it's kind of easy to tell or kind of get stuck into the story that you're telling with the bassoon in this moment. Are you focused on, at this time, so much on what the violin has played, or are you able to really be free, or are you kind of stuck with, well, she played this like this, so maybe I'll do something like this as well. Oh, I think I really definitely feel free because it's just a big change. Like the violin ends and then it's like I'm coming in in a different character. And yeah, there should be quite a bit of contrast. I think because there's so much material in in this particular piece, Scheherazade, that comes through all the different movements that you do sort of get affected by how your colleagues play, like just little turns of phrases. How how did they do that grace note? And you kind of think, oh, like sometimes, you know, we'll have a concert three times in a row. If Nuri does something slightly different, that, that I might respond to that in a way, like without even really thinking about it. But mostly, you know, you've been sitting there for a little while and this is the first big solo in the piece and you hope that your read responds, right? And you want that opening to have this like gentle lilt. So there's a lot going on in your brain <laughs> before you start that. Is there anything you can do to prepare before coming in for a solo where you've had to be sitting and counting rest for a while? I'm thinking the Stravinsky, you're able to tune with the orchestra and then the, or- then the conductor comes out and boom, you play. If you're sitting for a while... Can you do anything? I'm thinking like with brass instruments, you can blow into your instrument to keep it warm. You can even take the mouthpiece out and buzz into it with your fist closed so the sound doesn't really escape. Or bassoon, is there something like that? Or are you just kind of stuck? You'll often see, especially the the double reed players, right before a solo that's coming up, they'll like put their reed in their mouth. They might, you know, you kind of want to just get the feel of the the thing and you want to make sure it's moist, but not too moist. Scheherazade, in a way, you don't have to often don't have to sit there as long as you do for the beginning of the Rite of Spring. And the difference is because, I mean, the, the violin solo that comes in right before us is one of the shorter of the violin cadenzas. And you have just played the whole first movement, so, you, you know, you kind of get your mojo going. Whereas Rite of Spring, yeah, you could try that high C a million times when the orchestra is tuning, but then it gets quiet, and then the conductor comes out and stands there. And then somebody's phone goes off. Oh. And then there's coughing. And then there's, and sometimes it just feels like, I have to say, I'm getting a little tense just thinking about this. I, I'm getting tense hearing it. <laughs> and you're looking out at this giant hall with all the lights and you're like, ah. <sighs> I'll be honest yes. with you, Sue, because I've played it and we've, we've all played it many, many times, but every time I've had to play it. I'm sitting back there and I'm holding my breath a little bit. I'm, it's always just like I'm a little anxious too because it's such this um, – it's so delicate and it's so exposed. Yeah. So we've got Stravinsky. We've got Rimsky-Korsakoff. What else do we have? So I wanted to show a little bit of what we do most of the time, which is play solo lines that are exposed but maybe aren't the main melody. 
of what's going on. So you might have a clarinet tune or flute or oboe or violin, strings, whatever, and we're playing like a counter melody. And so this excerpt is from Brahms' Third Symphony. And this actually also often appears on auditions because it will give a committee. I know this isn't an audition podcast. You should probably do an audition podcast. People might find that interesting, <laughs> what what is goes on in mm-hmm. getting these jobs. But so this kind of material is you know where we get to play the inner lines, the inner voices. There's often very interesting harmonic, rhythmic things going on where we're following along and, and fitting it and, and really giving a texture to a solo line in, in another instrument or another section. How would you describe what's going on around you in the orchestra when you're playing that excerpt that you played? It's just a lot of woodwinds. There's a, the clarinet has the tune, and but there's also like you know you may have noticed there's some like legato stuff, but then there's like some shorter notes, and so at that point you have like flutes and oboes and things, and so we all have to try to line those up and get them to be generally the same note length. And then you're matching the clarinet, but then here comes the flutes, and then you need to kind of go with them. And one thing that's interesting about, I hope this doesn't sound too in the weeds of, but of orchestral playing, but if you think about like a string quartet or a brass quintet, like the string sound is homogenous and the brass sound, you'll have these brass choirs, whereas like in the woodwinds, like we've talk, talked about, the flute makes their sound one way and the clarinet makes their sound another way. And even the oboe and the bassoon, they're double reeds, but they... They are the closest in terms of like how our sounds are produced, but so like trying to match note lengths and the textures and stuff is a, is a big challenge. That's what makes the woodwind section so colorful, but it also makes it a big part of our lives and our challenging trying to match. Like here I have some short notes with the clarinet, but there I have some short notes with the oboe. And how do we all get them to start and end at the same time and have the same kind of shape, like a little you know, release at the end of the note, that kind of thing. So in that, in that Brahms excerpt, there's parts where, you know, we're going boop, 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 that kind of thing. And you just have to like line it up and have like a little delightful woodwind color of all of us playing all those little boop, boops at hopefully exactly the same time. You know, for people who aren't clear about like which woodwind is which, it's really worth trying to get a seat high enough up where you can see the woodwind section and in the Kennedy Center there's actually seats like right along the side where you're almost above the orchestra because there's so much going on back there and if all you can see is the strings which are fascinating and you can really follow along because you see their bows moving you don't realize like all the individual things that are going on in the back of the orchestra it's really fascinating I mean after all these years if I go you know, when visiting orchestras come and visit the Kennedy Center, I always try to get a seat where I can really see everybody and just see what all the individuals are doing. That also really helps if you're having trouble distinguishing, like, which one's the bassoon and which one's the clarinet. And wait, there's a bass clarinet, too? What, what's that? You know, <laughs> if you can see them while they're playing, you know, nowadays they're doing all these video productions, which I think really help to align, like, a sound with an instrument because they'll have the camera on the person who's playing the solo, and you're like, oh, that's what that sounds like. Okay, that's that thing. And after a while, then, you know, when you're in the audience, I mean, you know, I could be, like, watching a movie or TV, and I'll hear, like, the faintest three notes of bassoon, and I'm like, oh, there's a bassoon, you know, whereas, like, and somebody else will be like, wait, what? Right, (laughs) Like, they didn't hear that, but my ear is just, like, I grab onto the bassoon. But, you know, I get it that for a lot of people, it's just... There's a there's the orchestra is a complex organism. There's a lot of lot going on, and it's sometimes hard to tell who's making what sound. And hearing you describe in that excerpt for the Brahms just 
all of the things that go into it, there's a clarinet here, then there's a flute here, I'm playing short here, I'm playing long here, doing this and adapting all over the place. It sounds, just hearing your enthusiasm about it, it kind of, it speaks volumes to the gratifying nature that it can be just, I mean, playing solos is fun, it's, it is nerve wracking, but it's, it's fun and it's gratifying, but getting down to like the meat and potatoes of playing in an orchestra and working together with musicians, these interlines can be so gratifying in the teamwork aspect of it. It just sounds very infectious how you describe it with the bassoon. Yeah, yeah, it is really fun. It's, it's really, it can be good fun. So has bassoon technology changed? Like in the last 100 years for some instruments, what you play today is, I mean, it's, it's people 100 years ago could never even fathom of such quality. For the bassoon... Is there something similar, or has it kind of already been at its peak for a long time? Well, the bassoon that I play was probably built like in the 1930s, something like that. So there hasn't been a huge change. There are other makers coming up all the time, but yeah, it's not like... The fact that my bassoon was made in 1930 doesn't mean it only has six keys, right? <laughs> I mean, most of the developments happened prior to that. I'd say there there hasn't been a huge amount of, I mean, yeah, if you get into the weeds of it and talk to a bassoon maker, I'm sure they'd say, what are you talking about? We've done this and that with the bore and that F key plateau is this. And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. But So we moved that one millimeter right. and it's changed the world. <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's pretty intricate. I'm my repair guy, um, and if you heard my keys clacking, I apologize. Um, I'm going to be going down, and he's going to be, uh, you know, cleaning up the horns. I haven't been able to get down. But, I mean, the it is a very specialized sort of field of, like, people who work on professional-level bassoons. And, yeah, I travel to Atlanta once a year to get my horn sort of serviced. A pilgrimage. Yes. <laughs> A pilgrimage to Ken Potsik, the Mecca of Pe- Ken Potsik. Yeah, and they just make sure all the pads are seated correctly and sealing and the keys aren't too clacky and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. You mentioned a little bit ago some great advice. If you want to hear or see more of these woodwind instruments and differentiate them, get a seat in a concert where you can actually uh, see them like in that balcony or closer onto the side of the stage a little bit up. Mm-hmm. Is there anything else you wish that the common person, classical music listener, knew about the bassoon? Uh, beside for which one it is? Um, yeah. The other thing I was thinking um, is, I mean, this is ridiculous, but I wish people knew it had two O's in it. Somehow people spell it sometimes with one O, and I'm like, I don't get that. Two S's, two O's. You know, knowing which one it is and what the sound is like, you know, it's like the more you know, the more you know, and the more the more you can sort of appreciate the the intricacies of the writing and why a composer chose to put this in this instrument and not that instrument. Or a lot of times you'll have the same material passed around among the different instruments. And it's so it's cool to know, like, which one is doing what. That's a good point in that composers choose which instrument plays what for very, very specific and for for very real reasons. And if you're having trouble differentiating between them, I would say some people might say, well, I'll, I don't have the ears for that. I'm not going to be able to do that. And I think that's totally false. If you I think everyone can get to when they're listening to the music, really differentiate these things. And when you do, like you said, the more you know, the more you enjoy it, because also you're going to be asking more questions. Well, why why does Beethoven do this and Brahms does that or something else like that? And it just, it takes you down a a rabbit hole of musical discovery. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, just like, just like anything else, like if, you know, it's so easy to say, oh, I don't understand that. I can't tell the difference, whatever, whatever. But I mean, the human mind is pretty amazing. So if you if you want to, you can easily find a billion videos on YouTube of people playing, you know, bassoon excerpts or bassoon masterclasses or bassoon solos, concertos and chamber music. There's a terrific website called Orchestral Bassoonist. I think it's orchestralbassoon.com and which is, you know, written for bassoonists to it's just a compilation of again, it's always about the excerpts. Um audition excerpts, but you have, there's recordings. So if somebody is curious, like, you know, what the bassoon sounds like, that is a great place to go. And you can just click on all these different pieces. The music is there. 
there's a little bit of information about there's the score which like the entire orchestra music that's what I mean by that and then there's the the bassoon part and uh, several different recordings and just the clip of like the section where you can hear the bassoon so you can like listen to like six or seven different versions of different bassoonists playing the solo from Bolero something like that that's really great because it takes you right to the point where Mm -hmm. it is you don't have to go searching for something that you can't already here maybe well thank you so much sue for just enlightening us on on all things bassoon and how it fits in with the orchestra well thanks for having me on your show thanks for listening to classical breakdown for more information on this episode visit the show notes page at classicalbreakdown.org and if you have any comments or episode ideas send me an email at classicalbreakdown at weta.org I'm John Banther. Thanks for listening to Classical Breakdown from Classical WETA. ¶¶